Praise be Jesus Christ, Ave Maria, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray, pray for us, us for every course to thee. to thee. So I'm with Mr. Hugh Owen, the founder and director of the Colby Center for the Study of Creation. Uh, how are you doing, Mr. Owen? Oh, very well. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Yes. Praise God. And we hope that the internet connection holds and we find this conversation fruitful. Um, Mr. Owen, just to begin from my point of view, uh, I've been I've been following the, the Colby Center and some some talks that you've done probably for about five years now. Uh, I contacted you five years ago about coming to a parish where I worked at maybe to do some talks, but it just never it never panned out. Um, right. Currently, I am a religion teacher at a Catholic high school, and one of the courses I teach is sacred scripture. So we start in Genesis, and we go through to the apocalypse. If we have time, we we go through the Bible, and we so we, of course we begin by talking about the doctrine of creation. So this yes. year really prompted me to want to offer another perspective. Uh, to my students, but for anybody else that might be watching this, and I have some questions of my own. So again, this is, this, is a, this is a great blessing to have you on here. Let's begin uh, perhaps by you, you giving a little bit of your own testimony and your background. Certainly. So I usually begin by explaining that my father's father was a Baptist minister in Wales, in Great Britain, and my father was brought up in a very conservative Baptist home. But uh, when he went to university, he went to university in England, which was much more progressive than Wales. And already in the late 20s, early 30s, evolution ruled supreme. So his professors told him, we don't need the fairy tales in the book of Genesis anymore because science can explain everything. Evolution can explain the origins of man and the universe without any reference to God or any supernatural agency. And so my dad, like millions of other people then and now, was completely robbed of his faith in Christianity and became a secular humanist. But being an idealistic person from his Baptist upbringing, he went to work for the United Nations uh, at the very beginning, became an assistant secretary general, then co-administrator of the United Nations Development Program. And after 25 years with the UN, he was knighted by the Queen of England who just died and retired. But he was rather frustrated because he looked at the world and he saw that all the problems of the world were much worse than when the United Nations was started. Why was that? Well, once again, he turned to the intelligentsia that he knew, and they had the answer. They said, the reason the UN isn't making headway in solving the world's problems is it's not going to the root of the world's problems, which they said was overpopulation. Mm -hmm. That's why they said we have war and economic and social injustice and, and all these problems. Cut down on the number of people, then we'll have enough to go around, all our problems will be solved. And so my dad accepted to become the first ever Secretary General of International Planned Parenthood Federation at the very time when IPPF changed its position on abortion and became the world's number one promoter of abortion as well as contraception and sex education. And he held that position for just about a year when he died unexpectedly of a heart attack in London when I was just 16 years old. Now, I don't have the time to talk in detail about my conversion, but what is definite is that my father's death precipitated my conversion because even though I had been brought up with no prayer, no Bible, no church, or anything of the kind, less than two years after my father's death, I received the gift of faith, and I was baptized, confirmed, and made my first Holy Communion as a Catholic in the Princeton University Chapel, where I was enrolled as a freshman at the age of 18. Now, at that time, the chaplains at Princeton University were Jesuits, and 
they were firm devotees of Father Teilhard de Chardin and gave me a book so that I could learn the doctrines of the faith, which is notorious, uh, the Dutch catechism, but we call it the Dutch cataclysm yeah. because this is the book that has practically annihilated the Catholic faith in the Netherlands, which once had a vibrant Catholic community send a disproportionate number of missionaries all over the world, including here to the United States, who gave their lives to spread the true faith. But there's a theme that runs through the Dutch cataclysm, and it's this, that we live in a scientific age, and science has enlightened us so that we can understand everything in our faith in a new and deeper way. It sounds great. But then Father Schillebex and company proceed to sow doubt in the mind of the reader about everything from the existence of angels, the reality of Satan, the historical existence of Adam and Eve, original sin, the virgin birth of Christ, the bodily resurrection of our Lord, the intrinsic evil of contraception, and on and on. So I always say it's a miracle that I survived the Dutch cataclysm and came into the church at all. But in the depths of my soul, I never could accept this idea that scientists would discover anything new that's true that would contradict any authoritative teaching of the church that was handed down from the apostles. And eventually, I was delighted to discover that at the very time when my father was being robbed of his faith because there was nobody in his environment to tell him the other side of the story about evolution, St. Maximilian Kolbe was writing articles and sending them all over the world showing that the emperor of evolution was not wearing any clothes, that there actually wasn't any sound scientific evidence for this idea that matter came alive and turned into all the different kinds of plants and animals and then finally into human beings through the same material processes that are going on in nature today. And so eventually we founded the Kolbe Center for the Study of Creation to provide a forum for Catholic theologians, philosophers, and natural scientists all over the world who defend the traditional teaching of the church on creation and who expose the fatal flaws in the molecules to man evolution hypothesis in its theistic as well as in its atheistic guise. And that's what has brought me into this apostolate. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a lot there. Could you, before we continue, because this might be a new term to some, could you describe what we usually mean when we say theistic evolution? Certainly, and that's very important. So theistic evolution is the attempt to reconcile the Catholic faith with the molecules to man evolution hypothesis, which is the idea that matter came alive and turned into all the different kinds of plants and animals and the human body through the same material processes that are going on in nature now. Now it comes in a variety of forms in its theistic version, um, which means that God was involved in this process in some way. So at one end of the theistic evolutionary spectrum is the very popular view of Dr. Ken Miller at Brown University, one of the leading theistic evolutionists. And according to Dr. Miller and many, many other Catholic intellectuals today, God did create some matter about 13.7 billion years ago. But then according to Dr. Miller, this matter came alive and then turned into all the different kinds of plants and animals until a subhuman primate developed to the point that God could infuse a human soul into two or more of these subhuman primates. And that's how humans came into existence. But from the creation of the matter 13.7 billion years ago until the infusion of the human souls into two or more of these evolved subhuman primates. For this school of thought, everything in between occurred through the same material processes that are going on in nature right now. 
So that's one end of the spectrum. At the other end of the spectrum, you have the very popular view of Father Teilhard de Chardin as J. And according to Father Teilhard, God is identified with the universe in a way that makes his system a kind of what we would call pan and theism, because God is, is literally identified with the cosmos. He makes the matter come alive, evolves different kinds of organisms, destroys them to make something higher. And then finally, after hundreds of millions of years of death and destruction and extinctions, man evolves. And then according to the Teardians, man is now at the final stage of evolution, and we are going to take evolution into our own hands. We're going to change the genetics of plants and animals and our own genetics, and we're going to turn ourselves, or at least some of us, into Superman. And then there will be a one-world government with a one-world religion, what Teard called Father Teilhard called a new Christianity based on evolution. Those are his words. And we will reach perfection on earth. We will reach utopia, the omega point, through this process of taking evolution into our own hands and bringing it to perfection. But you see, wherever you fall on the theistic evolution spectrum, and all theistic evolutionists are somewhere on this spectrum. Every, everyone, whether they're at this end or that end or anywhere in between, they all deny an absolutely fundamental element of the traditional doctrine of creation that was handed down from the apostles. And it's what St. Thomas Aquinas in the Summa calls the first perfection of the universe, which he defines, and anybody can look this up, as the completeness of the world at its first founding, which means every kind of creature, not every breed of dog, but every kind of creature, every kind of plant, every kind of animal, and of course, mankind, Adam and Eve, all existed, each one perfect according to its nature, together with man and for man, in perfect harmony at the beginning of creation. That is the first perfection of the universe. That is a teaching of every father and every doctor of the church without exception. And it is denied by every form of theistic evolution. Thank you. It I want to I want to play on that a little bit because as I you you bring up theistic evolution, um, just a little backstory quickly myself. I'm a convert as well. I grew up as a Baptist. Um, yes. I went to a very small fundamentalist Protestant high school, and so we were taught creationism. Uh, we were taught creationism in in our science class. Um, yes. I I kind of fell away from my practice of the Christian faith as far as I knew it, and then. Thanks be to God, in the end of my 20s, I, I began to have a conversion in Catholicism. Like you, I was baptized, confirmed, or received yes. First Holy Communion. And then I, then I was hit with this. I had never really encountered, I suppose, Christians talking about evolution. I, maybe I was sheltered. But uh, as I came in through the RCIA process, uh, we didn't spend a lot of time, but it seemed to be taken for granted by most that some form of evolution was yes. just generally accepted by the magisterium. Um, yes. Since then, speaking to other people, I struggle myself with how to um, how to be faithful to the magisterium, how to take into consideration these different things, because it seems it, it seems like on one hand you have the traditional doctrine of creation. On the other hand, you have theistic evolution. It's it seems very difficult to balance those two within the same communion, within the same church, because as you yeah. pointed out, it seems at least it seems to say very different things about the dignity of the perfection of the universe, about humankind it, itself. Um, I wanted to read briefly. I'll just read a part. This is from uh, Richard Dawkins. Um, so the the 
famous new atheist Richard Dawkins, and he talks about how everything came by mere chance. And he says, on one planet, and possibly only one planet in the entire universe, molecules that would normally make nothing more complicated than a chunk of rock gather themselves into chunks of rock-sized matter of such staggering complexity that they are capable of running, jumping, swimming, flying, seeing, hearing, capturing, and eating other such animated chunks of complexity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if I teach, I'm just going to be on a, on a practical level. If I teach high school students um, that evolution is the way that God, you know, brought everything to the current stage, it doesn't sound much different than than Dawkins' view. Um, yeah. It it's and I, I I've listened to other theistic evolutions doing my own research, evolutionists, excuse me, doing my own research, and they will say, well, there, it, that doesn't have to be the case, but. One of the reasons I wanted to address this is on the practical, on the ground level, that's the way people take it. And yes. it can lead to a kind of, and some people kind of despair, loss of faith, maybe like your father. And in some people, a kind of apathy. Um, because yes. our origins speak a lot about our destiny. Um, so building off of that, um, so I did have a question about your father when he was in, in when he went to England. So do you think he would have he would have been taught eugenics? Was that part of? That was in the air, whether he was actually taught it in university, I can't say, but it was definitely accepted in intellectual circles. And he. I mean, my father was a decent man and he, he was really trying to do the right thing. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, eugenics knows how to put on a nice face and disguise the brutal, diabolical nature of it, of itself. <laughs> yeah. So I think my father would have gone along with it, like most of the intellectuals of the Western world. I mean, you just look at what was the Scopes trial about? was about a book that violated the law of Tennessee by teaching human evolution. But in all the media coverage, you rarely hear the fact that it promotes eugenics it, right in the textbook. I didn't, I wasn't and yet that was being celebrated as <clears throat> the Clarence Darrow representing the forces of light against the ignorant Bible thumper, William Jennings Bryan. And mm -hmm. yet it was championing a practice that forcibly sterilized tens of thousands of American citizens for yeah. no good reason. That's true. Like I see, I just recently went to the Pennsylvania, I live in Pennsylvania. I recently went to the Pennsylvania March for Life. Um, and so you constantly encounter so-called pro-choice, pro-abortion advocates and they they'll deny that if they know what eugenics is they'll deny that they are but when you have a conversation with them they have a they have at least a soft form of eugenics in mind when they champion yes. things like abortion and again not to put uh, I'm, I'm not going to as ascribe this to everyone but it seems to me very difficult for those who invariably those who accept uh things like abortion uh wide scale contraception, these kinds of things, which are contrary to Catholic teaching. Uh, invariably, they seem to embrace some form of evolutionism. And it, that seems yes. like that seems to play into the mindset that leads to that. Like you said, like Teilhard de Chardin, like this progress toward the Omega point. Um, and it, it, it's really wrapped up in the myth of progress uh things Absolutely. progressing toward and it seems to me like a an invert and we could call it an inverted divinization like we are yes. partakers in the divine nature through christ and the outpour of the holy spirit they want to be partakers in the divine nature through science and the genius of humanity artificial intelligence whatever that may be um yes those are points that people don't often hear uh mr owen would you please let's back up a little bit and so what is the 
let's talk about traditionally in the church, the church fathers. So what is what is the consensus of the fathers when it comes to the origin of man and the creation of the world? Well, let me begin with the most important doctrine in creation theology that has been almost completely forgotten in modern discourse, even within Catholic academia. And that is that every father and doctor, every pope and council father, in their authoritative teaching, from the beginning, distinguished between the work of creation, which was entirely supernatural, and the natural order, what the doctors like St. Bonaventure call the order of providence, what we are living in now. If you look in the Catechism of Trent, which is, which is the most authoritative catechism in the history of the Catholic Church, and which was the gold standard for teaching and preaching the dogmas of the faith in the entire world for 350 years, still authoritative, the only catechism that's quoted in the New Catechism, quoted 20 times, because it gives such beautiful, clear, precise definitions of the dogmas of the faith. And if you go to the first article of the creed and look up how the dogma of creation is defined, you'll see that St. Charles Borromeo and his co-authors made certain that every pastor in the world taught his people that when God finished creating Adam and Eve on the sixth day of creation, God stopped creating new kinds of creatures. And that is when the order of providence, the natural order, what we are living in now, began. And this is absolutely fundamental to this discussion. Because what it means is that for St. Thomas Aquinas and all the fathers and doctors without exception, creation is not a proper subject for natural science. Natural science deals with nature. It does not deal with the supernatural. So the biggest problem that arises when as Catholics we try to come to grips with the roots of the current crisis of faith and morals is that we have forgotten what for all our fathers in the faith until very recently was absolutely fundamental to understanding the origins of man and the universe correctly. And because when you understand what the Catechism of Trent and all catechisms taught until very recently, and that includes, for example, the Baltimore Catechism that was in use throughout the United States until very recently, you understand very well that the entire work of creation was supernatural. God willed into existence all the different kinds of plants and animals, not every breed of dog, for example, but some wolf kind of creature from which are descended every wolf, probably every coyote, every hyena, and every breed of dog on earth today in a devolutionary process. That's not an evolutionary process. And he created them all for Adam, whom again he created body and soul instantly and immediately, and Eve from Adam's side instantly and immediately. And then he was done because he had created everything that he wanted to create to make a perfectly complete, harmonious, beautiful universe for us. And that's when the natural order began. And so St. Albert the Great was a great natural scientist, but he would never have dreamed of thinking that by studying nature, he could understand how nature came to be. That wasn't the job of a natural scientist. The job of the natural scientist is to study the natures of things and their relationships, not to try to explain their origins. And it's only with the so-called enlightenment that you see a revolution beginning against this understanding of the distinction between creation and the order of nature. And Rene Descartes is the first Catholic 
thinker to begin to be taken seriously when after dabbling in the occult and living a very immoral life, he has his three mystical dreams in which he says that a spirit of truth possesses him and puts him on the path to develop a wonderful new way of, of thinking that will change the way everybody thought. It's with, it, it's with Descartes and, of course, Spinoza, Immanuel Kant, and the rest of the principal enlightenment so-called thinkers that they propose that it's more reasonable to explain the origins of things in nature, like the solar system, plants, animals, even the human body, in terms of the same material processes that are going on now in nature, instead of what they consider to be the strange idea that things just popped into existence in the beginning. But it's important for every Catholic to understand that Descartes' works were put on the index of forbidden books, because at the time that he proposed these ideas, every theologian worth his salt knew that this was nonsense. It's not reasonable to try to explain what God clearly told you was supernatural in terms of natural processes. That would be like looking at John's gospel, reading about the miracle at Cana, and saying, well, you know, I think it's more reasonable that we explain this in terms of some microbial activity in the water that somehow managed to turn the water into wine. Nobody in his right mind would consider that a reasonable alternative to what God clearly revealed, that it was a totally supernatural event. And the fathers noted that St. John includes the detail that there are six containers of water at the wedding at Cana, because the Father saw that our Lord wanted us to connect the fact that he used that divine creative power to instantly change ordinary water, which had no natural power to turn into wine, into the most wonderful wine that anybody had ever tasted in an instant. And this wine had all the appearance of having gone through a long natural process that actually never took place. God created it mature, if you will, and complete. Because he wanted us to understand that that is the same divine power by which with the Father and the Holy Ghost, he created a perfectly mature, complete, fully functioning universe for us and our first parents in the six days of creation. So I'm really harping on this point because in our experience, this is something that has been missing from Catholic education for a hundred years. It did not start with Vatican II. You can trace it back to, it was already beginning in the period in the pontificate of Leo XIII and St. Pius X. But St. Pius X, we could say, is the last pope who realized what was going on very clearly and tried to stop the trend. And we could say that from St. Pius X forward, this distinction between this complete supernatural work of creation and the natural order, the order of providence, simply almost disappears. There are individual theologians who maintain it, but it, it gradually get, reaches the point where in recent times, you had Father Peter, De, uh, Peter Damien Felmer of the Friars of the Immaculate who taught at the Seraphicum in Rome, who maintained this distinction, at least in his teaching, for which we're eternally grateful. But he's one of, of a handful of professional theologians who continue to teach the traditional distinction between creation and providence. And once that disappears, confusion reigns because now when you embrace the enlightenment framework which says that the same material processes that are going on now have been operating in more or less the same way from the very beginning of the universe you have an entirely new ball game now it's perfectly legitimate for natural scientists to study the universe as it is now and extrapolate from what they see all the way back to the very beginning of the universe. And that's how you get, for example, the Big Bang cosmology of Monsignor Lemaitre. But 
Monsignor Lemaitre should never be held up as some kind of Catholic hero because he went completely against the entire tradition of the church with his hypothesis. And it's not surprising that today, people who honestly examine the standard model of the Big Bang hypothesis recognize that it's a complete failure. The standard model today has to posit that 96% of the matter in the universe is dark matter and dark energy, which can't be observed. So they're basically agreeing with the fathers and doctors of the church that you can only explain, explain the origins of the universe supernaturally. But instead of going back to the traditional doctrine, they, they're such children of the enlightenment that they have to insist, no, there's this material explanation for everything. It's just that we can't observe it. We can't measure it. We can't identify the stuff that's actually making everything appear the way that it does. So that's the fundamental truth that needs to be reclaimed. On that foundation, it is very easy to explain the rest of what the fathers and doctors taught, which is Genesis is a sacred history. That's how the Catechism of Trent describes it. It's an accurate, accurate account of how God created the world and what happened in the first period of human history. And nowadays, it's, it's, it's incredible how many highly educated Catholics tell our young people that, yes, there were fathers who took Genesis as an historical narrative, but we have that great exception, St. Augustine. He took a purely figurative interpretation of Genesis. And so they, they try to use St. Augustine to distinguish us from those ignorant Protestant fundamentalists and they say, we as Catholics, we can take pride in the fact that St. Augustine took this figurative interpretation of Genesis and gave us a basis in the Fathers for reconciling the doctrine of creation with evolution. The problem with that is it's completely false. St. Augustine himself says in the literal interpretation of Genesis that the narrative in Genesis is not in the form of allegory, as in the Song of Songs, but from beginning to end in the genre of history, as in the Books of Kings. So the reality is, St. Augustine would have literally shed his last drop of blood for the literal historical truth of every word in the sacred history of Genesis, just as every other father and doctor of the church. The only point on which St. Augustine differed from the overwhelming majority was on the meaning of day in Genesis 1. And that is because St. Augustine did not have a perfect translation of the Hebrew text of Genesis. He had the Vedas Latina, the old Latin version. And in the Vedas Latina, it appears that there would be a contradiction between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 if you take the days of Genesis 1 as literal sequential days, as the other fathers did. And St. Augustine, knowing that there could not be any real contradiction in the inerrant scriptures, proposed an instantaneous creation of all the different kinds of creatures, which God then revealed to the angels under this figure of the six days of creation. But if he had had St. Jerome's accurate translation, which is faithfully translated in the Dewey Rams Bible, you'll see that the, dis the, the apparent contradiction between Genesis 1 and 2 completely disappears. And in that case, we have absolutely no doubt that St. Augustine would have subscribed to the majority view. But on every other point, he would have shed his last drop of blood for the literal historical truth of every proposition in the sacred history of Genesis. And even in, in his interpretation of day, he's still trying to defend the literal sense as intended by Moses. He's simply trying to avoid any kind of contradiction within the inspired text. So that's why in the Catechism of Trent, 
if you look up the first article of the creed, at the end of the explanation of the dogma of creation, it clearly states that if the pastor wants to teach his people how God created everything in the beginning, all he has to do is refer to the sacred history of Genesis and teach that to his people. Thank you. Thank you. That was a very in-depth answer. There's a lot there. That answered one of the questions that I often get that I was going to pose to you at the end that students will ask me about the, the literal six days. Um, so that, that seems to be a consensus with the fathers, the six days, except maybe yes. Justin who was trying to. Yeah. Okay. But one very important point. You see, Dr. Ken Miller is typical when he tells young people that Catholics never took Genesis as a literal historical account. It was only some Protestant fundamentalists who began to do that at the end of the 19th century. And we have St. Augustine, for example, he will say, who took this figurative approach. This is unbelievable. But the reason why he and others can fall into this error is because until very recently, no great doctor or great commentator, no great theologian ever referred to any conciliar decree or magisterial statement as the source of the church's teaching on creation. They just cited Genesis because all of them accepted it as God's revelation of how he created the world. But what happened was, at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, when modernism began to take over, the theologians who were trying to defend the traditional teachings of the church wanted to be able to show that they were not following a Protestant style of biblical exegesis. And so it became the modus operandi of conservative theologians to want to cite magisterial statements to back up their exegesis of the Bible. I've had traditional priests tell me with pride, I will never cite the text of the Bible by itself without a magisterial statement to back up the interpretation. I'm telling you, the fathers and doctors would have fainted to think that we would reach a point where it was not sufficient to cite the text of Genesis to establish a point. For them, if Genesis said that Adam lived to be 930 years old, they would have died for that. There was no need to cite some encyclical where the Pope ratified that, yes, that actually means what it says. Adam actually lived to be 930 years old. That would have been incomprehensible to them. But you see, we're in a real crisis now because even the theologians who are trying to defend tradition have fallen into this mentality and they will attack us because they'll say, if you're interpreting Lateran IV, which was the most authoritative uh, uh, which gave us the most authoritative, conciliar, dogmatic statement on creation in the history of the church. They'll say, if you're interpreting Lateran IV correctly as excluding theistic evolution or even progressive creation, the idea that God intervened by fiat over billions of years to create all the different kinds of creatures, they'll say, why can't you point to recent traditional theologians who are citing the council. And you know, for a long time, and I'm talking about 15 years of blood, sweat, and tears, it was very difficult for us to comprehend. And then we finally realized, after dedicating a tremendous amount of time and energy to this project, that it's because until very recently, no great commentator, no great theologian, certainly no doctor of the church would ever think to cite a council 
as the basis for the doctrine of creation. Every single one of them cited Genesis, and the councils were merely ratifying what was already contained in the sacred history of Genesis. I think I, that's an excellent point. I, I really didn't, now that you mention it, it, it really stands out that the, I'll often hear just on, just on the local level, you know, uh, theologians, but also pastors, et cetera, preaching, they'll quote councils or they'll quote Aquinas, which is great, but it, it's, it does seem to be that there, there's this attitude that these things, these magisterial statements take precedence over sacred scripture when as, as you point out like this is not not only for the doctrine of creation but for other things that maybe are controversial like the filioque the procession of the holy spirit um i believe you can defend all those dogmatic teachings about the blessed virgin mary from scripture all of these things yes. um and we really have relinquished i i was a fundamentalist type of christian a baptist and right the stereotype was Catholics don't read the Bible. They don't appreciate the Bible. Um, it was scripture that led me into the Catholic church. And I really think yes. we need to reclaim that, that it is, it is our text. It is our inspired word. These are our doctrines. Uh, one thing I will mention, you brought up the, the wedding feast at Cana. Um, yes. Because I've thought about this. I, I had the privilege the grace with my wife after we got married we went to the holy land we visited cana and we saw a replica of one of these stone jars they're huge people don't people think it means a small one they're for ritual ritual baths and they're big enough um, yes and i thought about the the new creation so the creation is the type new creation is the anti-type adam and eve you have christ and his blessed mother and our new yes. creation as children of the Father happens miraculously and instantaneously in baptism. So and, true. And then we grow by grace from there. And it seems every everything else in Scripture seems to be that mirror where, where the old, you know, it, then there's the mirror in the new, except if we go down the road of evolution. This is one of the problems I have. It seems to be an inversion of a kind, or it it, it seems to have it precisely backwards. Um, yes. Th then the traditional way to look at our creation as new sons and daughters of God the Father. Absolutely, and if if I could recommend, uh, of course, what I would recommend to your students and their families and and your viewers um, is our DVD series, Foundations Restored, because that really gives you a complete defense of what all the apostles, fathers, and doctors taught from the perspective of theolo theology, philosophy, and natural science. But, but one article that would be very important to recommend, which is freely available on our website, is on Lateran 4. And it, uh, I don't have the exact title in mind, but it's something like the Firmatere, which is the decree of Lateran IV on creation, where the dogma of creation was defined dogmatically, uh, excludes theistic evolution. But it's the full title is something like the Firmatere of Lateran IV in its historical context excludes theistic evolution. And what that article documents is that St. Dominic actually founded the Dominican order to combat a heresy that agrees with theistic evolution, not in what it affirms, but in what it denies. Because every council until Vatican II had as one of its principal objectives to identify contemporary errors and then to define the doctrines in opposition to those errors. And the error that Pope Innocent III wanted to rule out or condemn by defining the truth in opposition to it was the error of the Albigensian Catharist heretics who held that God created matter, but then the devil 
divided the matter into the plants and animals and the human body. Now, it is so ironic that today the Dominicans, not all, but most of them, are the greatest champions of theistic evolution because they are denying the very thing that their founder established their order to correct because the Dominican order was founded to defend the truth that God created directly all the different kinds of creatures, all the different kinds of plants and animals, and man, body, and soul. So theistic evolution is exactly, as you say, an inversion, not just a corruption, but an inversion of the truth. And the fact that the Dominicans are taking the lead in promoting it is an inversion of the right order of things in relation to the Dominican order itself. And St. Thomas Aquinas follows the teaching of St. Dominic. And you have to do all kinds of gymnastics to make St. Thomas into a person whose thought is compatible with theistic evolution. Thank you. And that article gives you the details, and I, I really encourage everybody to read it and see if you don't agree with us by the time that you're done. Thank you. By the way, I will, I'll look that article, I'll, I'll put a link to the Colby Center, I'll put a link specifically to that article and um, anything else that Great. we mentioned. Um, and, and while I'm on that point, if anybody is watching this, if you would like to talk to me from a theistic evolutionary point of view, I had trouble finding anybody uh, that, that would be willing to talk to me. But if anybody is, I'm open to have that discussion as well. Um, so as we begin to to wrap it up here, Mr. Owen, um, and thank you. This has been a this has been an absolute wellspring of information. This is very good. Um, could you touch upon the difference between and the importance of the difference between monogenism and polygenism and what we mean by those terms? Certainly. So monogenism means that all humans are descended from one set of parents, St. Adam and St. Eve. Polygenism means that all humans on earth are descended from multiple parents. And it's tragic that many theologians today point to certain language in paragraph 36 of Humanity Generis, the last authoritative document of the Magisterium on the subject of evolution, published by Pope Pius XII in 1950, to claim that while he says it's by no means apparent that this doctrine of polygenism can be reconciled with the faith, they say, well, it was by no means apparent to him, but it's now apparent to us in light of everything that we've learned in natural science. Well, in reality, as we document in our DVD series and in our publications, everything that natural science has actually learned makes it apparent that monogenism is the truth. Because even secular scientists, at least the majority as far as we know, admit that every human on earth today is descended from one man who's called Y chromosome Adam and one woman who's called mitochondrial Eve. Because when scientists studied the Y chromosome of men from every major people group on earth, they were astonished to find how homogeneous it is and how few mutations there were within the Y chromosome. And exactly the same thing happened when they studied the mitochondrial DNA that's passed from mother to daughter in every major people group on earth. What's more, when you look at the number of mutations in the mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosome, and you look at the rate of mutation, it's consistent with Y chromosome Adam and mitochondrial Eve living about 6,000 or 7,000 years ago in perfect agreement with the traditional chronology that every father and doctor of the church upheld from the time of the apostles. Now, the evolutionists will claim, yes, well, it does appear that 
th this is the case, but this is because there had been hundreds of thousands of years of evolution. And then perhaps through some combination of pestilence, tribal war warfare, natural disasters, the human population got reduced down to this very small number. And that's why everybody on earth is descended from this Y chromosome Adam and mitochondrial Eve. It doesn't have anything to do with the Adam and Eve in the Bible. Mm -hmm. But as we also document on our website, that is complete nonsense because there is now a very well-established principle in cutting edge genetics of genetic entropy. It is proven beyond any reasonable doubt that mutations are eroding the architecture of the human genome. Even the few so-called beneficial mutations do not add any new functional biological information to the genome. So we are not evolving into Superman, we are devolving. And therefore, if there had been a mythical, even 100,000 years of so-called evolution, prior to Y chromosome Adam and mitochondrial Eve, they would have been so genetically degenerate that they would probably not even have been able to have a single viable offspring. So no, it was by no means apparent in the time of Pope Pius XII, and we can say confidently, it's absolutely clear to us today that polygenism is a bankrupt hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I've, I've heard different... It I've heard different theories, like a bottleneck theory, where there there was uh, aeons of evolution, and then, like you mentioned, maybe a famine or something. You have this bottleneck down to this single pair, something like that, and you come out. But I, I think that's raises an interesting point. I'm not, as I said in our email exchange, I'm not qualified to speak right. about the science portion of that. Certainly, but uh, it is out there for people to find, and the the information is there. What I want to close with. Um, and then we'll we'll end with a prayer. And again, I thank you very much, yes. uh, Mr. Owen, for agreeing to this. And again, anybody who wants more information, I'll include the links below. And if you want to challenge this information from a theistic point of view, um, I would love to have that conversation as well and, and see where that leads us. But I know since I was a young man, a much younger man in experience not only in ac academic settings but in social settings if you mention anything like six thousand years old the earth seven days or six days of creation uh worldwide flood these kinds of things um, many people will laugh right in your face uh they they assume you're some kind of a um you're a you're retrograde you're a throwback you don't understand science I've been there. I've seen the debates play out about this is all just purely religion, and therefore we've shown that religion has no place in the in the the common square in in society has no place in the classroom. Um, I think it's important to get this out. If people do not agree with this, at least do the homework, look at the research that's been done, square this with traditional teaching, with the with the magisterium, with the fathers, and with, most importantly, as we mentioned, sacred scripture. If you want to laugh yes. at somebody after that, then that's on you. But I think most people just assume, like I began our conversation with many young people and older people, they'll assume evolution is true. They can't explain to you how it's supposed to work. That's my one of my problems with it. Um, yes. If I had more time, we have that icon of evolution where you basically have a chimpanzee, a man up to a man with a spear, and then Homo sapiens sapiens. That's a, that's ridiculous. I mean, no one no one takes that seriously. But then you have young people running around saying things like "we're from monkeys" and things like this. So I thank you, I thank you for this opportunity to to, to speak about this because you've been on the front lines of this for a while, doing this work. You bear witness in your own life through what happened to your father and um, may God rest his soul. Uh, what could happen to a, a devout young man or young woman that comes into contact with these things and does not have a grounding, something to hold on to. Um, but before we finish, uh, I think I covered everything I wanted to. I do I wanted to throw out there, you mentioned Descartes had this vision or dream of the spirit of truth. 
if I'm not mistaken, I think Teilhard de Chardin had some kind of quasi mystical yes. experience, spirit of the world or something, spiritus mundi or something came upon yeah. him. I remember reading on our on our website, foundationsrestored.com. You can anybody can watch the first two episodes of our DVD series for free. And in that, in those first two episodes, you will see, you will hear exactly what Father Teilhard de Chardin's mystical experience consisted of. Mm -hmm. And you will realize that his inspiration did not come from God or any Holy Spirit. Yeah. Um, I, I, maybe I, maybe I shouldn't mention this and maybe I shouldn't speculate because, um, he's he's not here to defend himself but when i i read that a few years ago when i did it reminded me of a similar thing i read that happened to the the famous occultist uh alistair crowley when he went into the he had a similar kind of experience so i'm, I'm very wary when people say that they've had those kind of experiences and especially we don't base our doctrine etc off of no kinds of things uh before we close is there anything you'd like to add mr owen Yes, I would like to emphasize that the most important reason why every Catholic should investigate this subject and, God willing, embrace the doctrine of creation that was handed down to us from the apostles is not because evolution is the foundation of the entire anti-culture of death, although it is. The main reason why we hope and pray and we work so that every Catholic will rediscover this fundamental teaching and embrace it is because this is not only the foundation of our faith, it's the foundation of our spiritual life. St. Thomas teaches in the Summa Contra Gentiles that the opinion of those who say that it doesn't matter what we believe about creation as long as we have a correct opinion about God. He says that is notoriously false because, he says, an error about creation is always reflected in an error about God. So what's really at stake is the character of God. And when you believe, as all the apostles, fathers, and doctors of the church did about creation. What happens is your relationship with God is placed on the proper foundation. You, you then understand the way that we should, that God is all good, all loving, and all wise, and that all the negative things that we see and experience in this world are not the result of God's action. They are the consequence of sin. And that allows us to have a kind of intimacy with God and trust in God that every Christian has as part of his birthright, but which theistic evolution and progressive creation have done a great deal to erode, if not destroy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Mr. Owen. We're going to close it here. So we'll we'll end yeah. with a prayer. And I thank you very much for your time. And nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritui Sancto. Sicu terat in principio et nunc et semper in secula seculorum. Amen. Nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless.